Good morning, dear students. Today we will finish uh, the lecture of CNS infection. We start by discussing cerebral abscess, uh, which is a suppurative infection of brain parenchyma. It usually develops as a result of a contiguous spread of infection. So whenever there is an infection in the, in the, in the neighboring structures of the brain, like paranasal sinuses, mastoiditis, otitis media, osteomyelitis, or when there is a trauma to the head or surgery, infection uh, abscess may occur within the brain parenchyma. Less commonly, hematogenous spread is also a cause of cerebral abscess. Usually when it happens through or via the hematogenous spread, it causes multiple abscesses. A, big, uh, a good example of that is uh, subacute bacterial endocarditis. Subacute bacterial endocarditis may cause showering of the abscess into multiple areas of the brain. Usually the microorganisms that causes cerebral abscess are multiple microorganisms, not a single microorganism, and it depends on the age of the patient and the immunological status. Cerebral abscess that arise from dental, frontal, or ethmoidal sinuses tend to involve the frontal lobe while those arising from the sphenoidal sinuses or otitic infection particularly involve the temporal lobe. The onset is usually subacute. It may cause fever or not, because only 50% of patients with cerebral abscess present with fever. The rest, especially those who are old, they don't have fever. They may present with headache. They may present with uh, features of raised intracranial pressure like headache, nausea, and vomiting. They may present with a space-occupying lesion feature like seizure or focal neurological deficit, deficit. Rupture of an abscess into a ventricle may manifest a severe headache and meningeal sign. Usually, patients who have got cerebral abscess, they don't have meningeal sign. But whenever there is a rupture into the ventricular space, this will cause meningeal irritation and the patient may present with severe headache and meningeal irritation. Now this is a brain MRI showing an abscess which is in the left temporal region. This is T2. In T2 we see the edema clearly and we see the abscess. In T1 we see the ring. Usually there is a ring enhancement surrounded by edema. Let's talk about the stages of cerebral abscess formation. Usually when a bacteria invades the brain parenchyma, it goes through four stages. Stage one is called early cerebritis. It starts from day one to day three. Second stage is called late cerebritis. It starts from day four to day 10. In stage one and stage two, if the patient was managed to be diagnosed early, medical treatment may be the only treatment that the patient needs. In third stage, there will be capsule formation. From day 11, it's called the stage of early uh, capsular formation from day 11 to day 14. And from day 14 up, there will be a, late st a stage of late capsular formation. Whenever a capsule surrounds the abscess, medical treatment alone is not possible unless there is surgical drainage with it. This is a brain CT showing multiple cerebral abscesses. Usually when uh, the abscess uh, is spread by hematogenous spread, this patient has got gram-negative septicemia. You see that it usually involves the basal ganglia. Multiple hematogenous spread cerebral abscesses, mainly in the region of basal ganglia. How we investigate and treat such cases? Usually when you receive such a case in the emergency department, you do the routine job, you admit the patient, you search for white BC, ESR, C-reactive protein, renal and liver function. There might be leukocytosis, there might be elevation of the inflammatory markers like ESR and CRP. And when you suspect a CNS infection, you routinely send for blood culture. In cerebral abscess, only 10% of those who have cerebral abscess may reveal or yield a positive blood culture. Unlike bacterial meningitis and pyogenic meningitis, up to 50% of cases may be positive. Then you send for an imaging, whether CT scan or MRI. Usually MRI is more 
sensitive and it documents the extent of surrounding edema more accurately there might be a small abscess or multiple abscesses all are revealed better by brain MRI although CT is also a very good option in the emergency department remember that in cerebral abscess lumbar puncture is contraindicated whenever the capsule has formed and there is a mass so if you see a brain abscess by CT scan or MRI uh, it's better not to do lumbar puncture because of risk of herniation how we treat such cases treatment is surgical and medical regarding the medical treatment we should give third or fourth generation cephalosporin like cefotaxime, ceftriaxone or cefepime plus metronidazole so we give metronidazole plus third or fourth generation cephalosporin Whenever there is head trauma or recent neurosurgery, we should cover staph and cover pseudomonas. So we give ceftazidime and vancomycin. Meropenem is a good alternative to ceftazidime. The goldstone management of cerebral abscess is aspiration and drainage of the abscess so the abscess should be drained the best way is by stereotactic guidance so we give antibiotic to the patient for about six to eight weeks plus we ask the neurosurgeon to do aspiration and drainage of the abscess uh, it's useful for the diagnosis and th for therapy complete excision of bacterial abscess via craniotomy or craniectomy is generally reserved for multi-loculated abscess or those in which stereotactic aspiration is unsuccessful so whenever uh, aspiration and drainage is not possible complete excision by craniotomy or craniectomy is a very good option we have indications for medical therapy alone from the beginning of the lecture we talked about cerebritis if the patient is in the stage of cerebritis there is no need for surgery if the abscess is very small less than two to three centimeter it may resolve with proper antibiotic therapy if the abscess is not accessible surgically so we have no choice we just have medical therapy lastly if the patient was very tired for example he wasn't fit for general anesthesia or neurosurgical procedure or uh, he is too tenuous to uh, follow uh, to allow performance of neurosurgical procedure in that case there is no option but to give antibiotic for six to eight weeks plus the patient should receive anticonvulsant because 35 percent of them will present with seizure and this anticonvulsant should continue at least three weeks after resolution of the abscess another subject that we will discuss today is tetanus tetanus is a disease preventable by immunization caused by a neurotoxin tetanospasmine elaborated by the anaerobic gram positive rod clostridium tetany it's found in soil and feces which persist as a resilient spore capable of surviving many years and resistant to most of the disinfectants and boiling for up to 20 minutes so the bacteria actually is very resilient especially when it is in the spore stage it may survive for several years it may survive disinfectants and even boiling when it enters the body it needs an anaerobic condition to germinate when the spore germinates in the appropriate and usually it happens in a dirty wound sometimes it's a trivial wound but when it is dirty and not cleaned the toxin will be produced it will be liberated from the bacteria and it will bind to the peripheral motor nerves before being transported via retrograde axonal transport into the spinal cord or brain the toxin ultimately migrates to the presynaptic terminals inhibiting release of GABA and glycine GABA and glycine are the major inhibitory neurotransmitters in the central nervous system so this toxin will inhibit the inhibitory neurotransmitters this will cause firing of the motor and autonomic nervous system of the body in the absence of inhibitory influence of GABA and glycine alpha motor neuron fires rapidly producing muscle spasm and rigidity in the uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system will also be involved this will lead to the release of catecholamine increased catecholamine and sympathetic overactivity tetanus occurs in neonates in neonates is called tetanus neonatorum when there is contamination of the umbilical stump unfortunately tetanus neonatorum carries a very bad prognosis 
almost all the cases will pass away. The mortality is nearly 100%, unlike uh, tetanus in adults, which is only 10% mortality, but tetanus neonatorum causes 100% mortality. Children and adults uh, may develop tetanus as a consequence of infected wound, skin laceration, or as a consequence of dirty intramuscular injections, drug abuse, occasionally surgery. Usually, it happens in immune-compromised patients, as usual. Whenever the patient is above 65, it's a risk factor. In neonates, it's also a risk factor. How the patient presents. The incubation period varies from few days to several weeks. Sometimes, there is a condition which is called uh, latent tetanus. The spore may uh, remain in the wound for several years and the patient may later on develop tetanus. This is called latent tetanus. There is another condition which is called localized tetanus or local tetanus. Sometimes the feature of tetanus only happens in one limb or one part of the body. This is local tetanus. But usually the most common scenario is that localized spasm or rigidity starts from the limb of the, that was affected by the wound. Later on it will spread to other parts of the body. The onset may be back pain, increased muscle tone, and rigidity of the masseter muscles, leading to lockjaw or trismus. Later on, there will be facial, the facial muscles will be affected, which is called rhesus sardonicus. It's called rhesus sardonicus. There is a localized stiffness near the injury with substantial rigidity of the axial muscles with involvement of the neck, back, abdomen, and in severe cases, reflex spasm and opisthotonus. There might be paroxysmal contraction. The paroxysmal contraction is a complication. It may cause a fracture. It may cause avulsion of the tendons. It may cause damage to the muscle. Damage to the muscle causes rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis will cause renal failure. So these are all complications of this paroxysmal contraction of the muscle that happens due to excessive firing of the motor neurons due to lack of inhibition. This spasm may also affect the respiratory muscle. It may cause vocal cord obstruction and asphyxia. It may also cause affection of the uh, deglutition and dysphagia, excessive bronchial secretion, excessive salivation. Autonomic feature may also happen. Blood pressure may fluctuate. It may cause uh, hyperpyrexia, temperature may fluctuate, there might be arrhythmia, there might be heart failure, there might be excessive gastric excretion, there might be diarrhea, acute renal failure, and volume depletion. So these are all complications of tetanus. How we diagnose a case of tetanus? The diagnosis is predominantly clinical. From the history of the spasms and examination findings, so we totally depend on clinical examination. Usually the patient gives a history of a trivial or a dirty wound a few weeks before. Later on the patient presents with feature of uh, paroxysmal muscle spasm and pain. So we suspect tetanus. Culture of the microorganism, Clostridium tetani, from a wound is confirmatory. Serology is also uh, supportive for the diagnosis with, with serum tests for tetanus toxin and tetanus antibody. So there will be uh, tetanus toxin and antibody in the serum. These are all confirmatory for the diagnosis. The most important point is that such cases should be managed in intensive care unit. Intensive care unit admin, admission and supportive care and nursing care, which are the mainstay of management of patients with tetanus, has reduced mortality into 10% in adults. Severe muscle rigidity may last for weeks and assisted ventilation may be required for several weeks. Complete recovery is typical, although mild painful spasms can persist for months. This table shows us uh, how we manage a case with tetanus. When we receive the patient, first, because of the release of the toxin from the site of the wound into the bloodstream, there is unbound toxin. It should be neutralized. We should give tetanus immunoglobulin. Intramuscularly in multiple sites, 
5 to 10,000 international units. In the event of reduced availability of TIG, intravenous human normal immunoglobulin can also be used. So the mainstay of management is neutralization of the toxin by giving tetanus immunoglobulin. This will prevent further release of the toxin. Debridement of the wound should be done. This will also arrest the toxin release. The antibiotic of choice is metronidazole for 7 to 10 days to kill the bacteria. Supportive therapy, as we discussed, if there is arrhythmia, it should be managed. If there is, uh, for example, uh, cardiorespiratory arrest, it should be managed. If there is renal impairment, electrolyte disturbance, acid-base disturbance, all should be managed accordingly. If the patient needs assisted ventilation, uh, intubation and uh, vent uh, assistant ventilation should be uh, supplied for the patient. If there is paroxysmal muscle spasm to prevent rhabdomyolysis and renal failure, benzodiazepines like midazolam and diazepam should be given to the patient. After the patient recovers from tetanus, he should receive active immunization. Immunization is recommended following recovery from the tetanus. Primary childhood immunization programs as five doses of combined DBT, which is diphtheria, pertosis, and tetanus in the UK is given at age two months, four months, six months, three to five years, and last dose is three, 13 to 18 years. So this every child receives this, and booster should be given every 10 years. But in case the patient develops tetanus after he recovers from the illness, he should receive active immunization. Our next subject is viral diseases of the central nervous system. First, we talk about viral meningitis or what's called aseptic meningitis. Uh, it is one of the benign conditions. Uh, the most common virus that, uh, that causes viral meningitis is the non-polio enteroviruses. Non-polio enteroviruses, especially the ecovirus and Coxsackie A and B viruses. These are the major causes of viral meningitis. They usually present with a triad of headache, vom uh, vom headache, neck stiffness, and fever. But the general condition is of the patient is very well. He is not ill. His level of uh, consciousness will not be deteriorated. And uh, most importantly, uh, almost all of them will be recovered completely without any complication. So it's a benign condition. Sometimes such cases are actually managed in the uh, in the outpatient without even admitting the patient, but a high index of suspicion is needed for such cases, not to miss it with TB meningitis or pyogenic bacterial meningitis. But why sometimes it is missed with, with such conditions? Because uh, viral meningitis, we talked about the CSF finding in, vi in viral meningitis in general. We said that it causes lymphocytic pileocytosis. If you remember from the previous lecture, we said it is one of the causes of lymphocytic pileocytosis. Because we have so many causes of lymphocytic pileocytosis, that's why a high index of suspicion is required in such cases. Lymphocytic pileocytosis may be caused by viral meningitis. It may also be caused by other conditions. One of them, which is very common in our locality, it's called partially treated bacterial meningitis. partially treated bacterial meningitis. When we receive patients uh, in our hospitals, such cases who have pyogenic or bacterial meningitis, before arriving at hospital, he has received antibiotics several times. He may go to a paramedics because of headache and fever. He receives oral antibiotic. When he comes to us and we do CSF, we see that the CSF actually is of lymphocytic. It's predominantly lymphocytic. Still, we may regard such cases as bacterial because we depend on other criteria. For example, the patient is not well. He, there is disturbance in the level of consciousness. There might be seizure. The CSF color may not be clear. It could be turbid. Uh, the sugar is very low. In such cases, although the CSF is mostly lymphocytic, we suspect bacterial meningitis. Another one is TB. 
TB meningitis is another differential diagnosis. Another differential diagnosis is parasitic. Parasitic, protozoal, helminthic, protozoal. These are all causes of lymphocytic pileocytosis. Another cause, lastly, is called carcinomatous meningitis or uh, meningeal carcinomatosis. So the cause could be carcinomatous. Carcinomatous meningitis, especially those uh, who have hematological malignancies, the hematological malignancy may invade the leptomeninges. It may cause enhancement of the leptomeninges if we do MRI of the brain and spinal cord with contrast. And when we do CSF, we may see lymphocytic pileocytosis in such cases. So we should bear in mind these differential diagnoses. Please uh, bear in mind that uh, any case with lymphocytic pileocytosis could be due to partially treated bacterial meningitis. Of course, we have also listeria. If you remember from the last uh, lecture, we talked about listeria and we said a proportion of them will present with lymphocytic pileocytosis. Viral meningitis is a relatively, relatively uncommon complication of systemic viral infection. Most viruses gain access to the body from the oropharynx. They are multiplied in the lymphatic tissue, spread to the bloodstream via viremia, and, and they will cross the choroid plexus or capillary endothelial cells to reach the CNS. In viral meningitis, there may be a flu-like prodrome, followed by a sudden onset of intense frontal headache, fever, and neck stiffness. These are the triads that uh, CNS infection present. It's associated with photophobia, malaise, myalgia, severe nausea, and vomiting. Sometimes the patient needs admission just because of the severe nausea and vomiting. We admit the patient for several days. The patient just receives intravenous fluid, antiemetic, and paracetamol. Uh, just supportive treatment is enough in most of the cases of viral meningitis. Even antiviral therapy may not be needed. Although there is pyrexia and neck stiffness meningeal signs, patients are generally less unwell than those with bacterial meningitis. You see that the patient is stable most of the time. Diagnosis, as usual, we send for the basics. We may see leukocytosis. CSF, we talked about the CSF. We said it is clear. Slightly there is leukocytosis, which is mainly lymphocyte, up to 1,000 cell. Uh, the sugar is normal. Viral isolation may be done. Usually, PCR is very sensitive for the diagnosis of viral RNA or DNA. So we send for PCR. Although viral isolation is also maybe undertaken from throat, urine, stool, or antibody, and antibody studies are possible in the serum or CSF. How we manage such cases? As we said, it is mainly supportive. But it is usual to admit a patient to exclude bacterial meningitis. This is the important point. It is very dangerous to say that this is benign and send the patient home. A clinical diagnosis of viral meningitis is not secure. Substantial errors have occurred by, resuming, by presuming a viral infection when the underlying infection has been pyogenic or tuberculous. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. I'm going to tell you a little if the cause is a herpes virus, we can give a cyclovir or one of the families of a cyclovir, like famcyclovir, valacyclovir, gancyclovir, forscarnet. The only therapy of clinical use in enterovirus meningitis is immune serum globulin. Usually, the patient recovers completely without any complication within one to two weeks. On the other hand, Encephalitis, viral encephalitis, is a very dangerous condition. If the patient was not managed appropriately and urgently, the mortality may reach 90%. Even with therapy, the mortality is 20%, and the morbidity is very high. Most of the cases will present with focal neurological deficit even after they completely recovered from viral encephalitis. It is an infection that invades the parenchyma of the brain. It is caused by a virus. It causes diffuse inflammatory process. Sometimes it causes necrosis, hemorrhage in the area. 
The most common virus that affects uh, human being and causes encephalitis is herpes simplex type 1. Although varicella, epstein, cytomegalo and other and enteroviruses may cause it and adenoviruses, but the most common virus that causes viral encephalitis in human being is herpes simplex type 1. The patient presents how the patient presents to us. Usually, it affects, as usual, infants and patients above 65. So those who are immune compromised are more prone to develop uh, encephalitis. It is characterized by fever in 90% of cases. Because the virus invades the brain parenchyma, it will present it will, uh, with features of de depression of the level of consciousness, seizure and focal neurological deficit. This is a rule. When an infection affects the, only the meninges, you see headache and neck stiffness. When it invades the brain parenchyma, the patient presents with focal neurological deficit, seizure and depression in the level of consciousness. And because this virus, apart from the brain parenchyma, also invades the meninges, there will be also meningeal sign. So seizure and impairment of level of consciousness which are common. This will distinguish acute inf uh, infective encephalitis from meningitis. There will be headache, pyrexia, and meningism. This means that the leptomeninges has been irritated, while parenchymal involvement causes focal neurological deficit. But which area of the brain is involved by this virus? Usually it affects the mesial temporal lobe and inferior and orbital frontal lobe. That's why such cases usually present with seizure because mesial temporal lobe is one of the most common epileptogenic areas in the brain. When it is involved by a pathology, the patient presents with seizure. This is one. This area is also responsible for memory because the limbic system is there. The orbitofrontal system is responsible for behavior. Sometimes such cases present with psychosis. I remember we saw a patient she came to the emergency department. She had psychosis. She was admitted to the psychiatric department. In the psychiatric department, they consulted us. When we saw the patient, there was fever. There was meningeal irritation. There was focal neurological deficit. We suspected herpes simplex encephalitis. And the MRI and other investigation confirmed the diagnosis. So uh, because of this, uh, this area, which is involved by the virus, causes epilepsy behavioral abnormality and memory loss, we should bear in mind that not all psychiatric emergencies that come to the emergency department are actually psychiatric. We should exclude organic causes. More commonly, behavioral and speech disturbances develop and abnormal movement are associated with lesion in the basal ganglia. Herpes simplex encephalitis, as we said, the majority are caused by herpes simplex type 1. Primary infection, as usual, it, uh, it is in the oropharyngeal mucosa before the virus is transported via retrograde transmural spread via the trigeminal or the olfactory system. Either it reaches the olfactory bulb or trigeminal ganglion. So in the, from the oropharynx, either it enters the olfactory bulb via the olfactory nerve or it goes to the trigeminal ganglion via the trigeminal nerve. If you see labial herpes, it's okay. If you don't see it, it is not of clinical significance because it has been shown that most of the cases who have herpes simplex encephalitis, they don't have labial herpes. The herpes virus may lead to inflammation, infection, and necrotizing lesion. It particularly infects the inferior and mesial temporal lobes, which may also involve the orbitofrontal cortex and limbic structure. That's why patients who recover from herpes simplex encephalitis, after a while they come to you, they say that everything is okay, but I have a problem with my memory. I cannot remember many things. I cannot learn new things because the limbic system or limbic structures in general has been affected by the virus. The onset is acute. It causes fever and headache. Most importantly, there is alteration in the level of consciousness, unlike viral meningitis. It may develop gradually or rapidly over a matter of hours. The most common manifestations are personality change, as we said, and dysphasia. It may cause psychotic features, as I told you from that case. 
Less commonly, it may develop, the patient may develop hemiparesis or visual field defect. If you remember, we discussed the visual field, the pathway of visual field in the clinical sessions. Uh, when the optic radiation passes through the parietal lobe, the superior branches pass through the parietal lobe. Inferior branches, which are called Meyer's loop, pass through the temporal lobe. This inferior branch or Meyer loop may be damaged by the virus. It will cause contralateral superior quadrantanopia. So it causes a superior quadrantic visual field effect. Focal or generalized seizure may happen, as we said. When you receive the patient, apart from the basic investigation that we already talked about, there are specific investigations which are very useful for the diagnosis of herpes simplex encephalitis. MRI is sensitive. It's a very sensitive tool. It may detect the lesion in the temporal lobe in up to 95% of the cases. It characteristically shows a high signal area of unilateral or bilateral. By the way, it's not necessary to be unilateral. Sometimes we see bilateral involvement of the temporal lobe by herpes simplex. There is high signal intensity with focal edema on T2 in the medial and inferior temporal lobes. EEG is also a very useful tool for the diagnosis of herpes simplex encephalitis. It characteristically shows plates, which are periodic lateralized epileptiform discharges every two to three seconds. CSF is just like viral illnesses. The opening pressure may be increased, mild to moderate lymphocytic pileocytosis, mild to moderate elevation of protein, normal or mildly decreased sugar. Sometimes there is blood due to damage to the brain parenchyma. We may see blood in the CSF. PCR is very sensitive for the diagnosis of the DNA of herpes simplex. Brain biopsy is rarely undertaken, but it may be considered if diagnostic uncertainty remains. At this EEG, usually, uh, I don't know whether you took EEG lectures in the introduction lecture or not, some uh, simple uh, basics of EEG I'm talking about. When the patient is opening his eyes, there will be predominant occipital alpha activities. When he uh, or close, uh, closes his eyes, sorry, there will be predominant alpha activities in the occipital lead. When he opens his eyes, there will be predominant beta activity. In encephalopathies in general, there will be diffuse delta activity in adults. If the encephalopathy is caused by a metabolic cause, the it causes generalized low, uh, low frequency, high amplitude delta activities, which are also called triphasic waves, like what happens in hepatic encephalopathy, for example. If the encephalopathy was caused by a viral infection, there will be a low amplitude delta activity. These are all low amplitude delta activities. But specifically in herpes simplex encephalitis, we see, we see something specific. In the left temporal and frontal leads, the odd numbers are referring to the right side of the brain. The even numbers, uh, sorry, the odd numbers are referring to the left side of the brain. The even numbers are referring to the right side of the brain. It's right side number Jutana. Number attack and left side. Here in the left frontal and temporal leads, F refers to the frontal lead, T refers to the temporal lead, O refers to the occipital lead. Mainly in the frontal and temporal lead, there are periodic lateralized epileptiform discharges every two to three seconds. This is an MRI from a patient with herpes simplex encephalitis. It shows a right temporal hyperintense lesion, characteristic of herpes simplex. How we manage? The patient should be admitted immediately, if necessary, in the intensive care unit. If there is compromise of respiration, he may be intubated also. We should give high dose of intravenous acyclovir. By the way, such cases may present with status epilepticus. يعني تونا خوشا كبو يبا ستيتز ابليبتي كزي يبا لان يكن جاريتي لجي يعني اتوشي ستيتز بوا You search for the cause, you find that it is due to herpes simplex You admit the patient to the intensive care, you put the patient on ventilator, you manage status epilepticus plus you start intravenous acyclovir 
10 to 15 milligram per kilogram body weight every eight hour. It will reduce the mortality up to 20 percent. And you get to drug management, okay, the mortality is 70 percent. If you man don't manage at all, it may reach 90 percent. 20 percent mortality still if you manage the patient properly. It's also a proper treatment for varicella zoster. The duration of treatment is between 14 to 21. Usually in adult, we give two weeks treatment. In children, pediatric age, they give three weeks treatment. But the best way is to do repeated PCR. If the PCR becomes negative, until the PCR becomes negative, you should give anti antiviral therapy for this patient. Occasionally, herpes simplex virus may be resistant to acyclovir. Foscarnate, in that case, is indicated. They develop seizure. We should treat seizure also, just like brain abscess. Steroids sometimes is needed if there is cerebral edema. Occasionally, intracranial pressure monitoring, even surgical decompression. To, in the site of the CNS uh, infection or parenchymal infection by the virus, there might be severe intra, uh, raised intracranial pressure, they may do craniotomy and surgical decompression. The mortality, as we said, has become 20%, but still there is significant morbidity. Up to 69% will develop memory impairment because of involvement of the limbic system. Personality and behavioral change may happen in 45% because of involvement of the orbitofrontal area. Epilepsy up to 25 because of involvement of mesial temporal region. Aphasia may happen because of involvement of the inferior frontal area. And you know that the inferior frontal gyrus is the area of Broca, Broca's area. Such cases may develop Broca's aphasia. Early treatment is essential for the reduction of mor morbidity. This is very important, particularly before the development of impairment of consciousness. If you manage to give antiviral therapy for such cases before the development of impairment of consciousness, you may get a very good result. The last subject is rabies. Rabies is caused by a bite of a wild animal, either a canine or a bat. It's caused by Lisa virus. The virus may replicate locally in muscle, or it may attach to a nerve ending. So whenever there is a bite, it will either replicate in the nerve ending or the muscle. Then it will retrogradely pass to the central nervous system. In the central nervous system, the virus will undergo massive viral replication. central nervous system. Before transsynaptic transmission of the virus occurs from cell to cell. In this stage, if we do brain biopsy for such a patient, we will see that there will be protein accumulation in the cytoplasm, appearing as inclusion bodies. They are called negri bodies. The clinical feature may develop one to three months after the bite. The onset of the pro happens with a prodrome of fever, nausea, vomiting, chills, malaise, fatigue, insomnia, together with the development of pain, pruritus, paresthesia, and fasciculation at the site of the bite. Usually there are two clinical scenarios. The most common clinical scenario that we see frequently and in most of the cases, in 80% of them will present with furious rabies. It's called furious rabies. 20% they have paralytic rabies. In furious rabies, it is characterized by fluctuating episodes of excitement, hyperexcitability, with periods of lucidity, aggressive behavior, confusion, and hallucination. So the patient becomes aggressive. He presents with acute psychosis associated with autonomic dysfunction, hypersalivation, sweating, piloerection. Patients develop severe muscle spasm in the th throat, trunk, respiratory muscles triggered either by a sight or sound of water or attempt to drink, hydrophobia, or even a draft of air, aerophobia. The spasm causes generalized extension, convulsion, opistotonic posture. Death usually happens within one week. Unfortunately, this is a very grave condition. The patient will die within one week and there is no treatment so far. 
although few cases have survived rabies, but the majority of them will die, and they will die within one week, and unfortunately, they will suffer until they die. That's why the aim of management is only supportive. You reduce pain, you reduce panic attack of the patient, you reduce psychosis of the patient, you put the patient in a calm state, and you let him die peacefully. This is the aim of management of such cases. Few cases have survived uh, rabies. Maybe they have received vaccination before traveling to the endemic areas, or they, they just got the second type of rabies, which is called paralytic rabies. It is associated with ascending paralysis, leading to constipation. So there will be ascending paralysis, constipation, urinary retention, respiratory failure, and inability to swallow. The diagnosis is from the clinical feature plus history of exposure to a bite from a wild animal in an endemic area, of course. CSF may show monocular pileocytosis. It is the same, lymphocytic pileocytosis, usually within the first week, but serum neutralizing antibodies are not present until the 10th day. Viral isolation is occasionally possible from saliva, throat, trachea, CSF, or brain biopsy and skin biopsy, and immunofluorescent antibody techniques will demonstrate an antigen in a small nerve of the skin taken from a nape of neck, often from the hair follicles. PCR is highly sensitive for the diagnosis of the virus RNA. Postmortem virus isolation and brain culture should be taken if possible. It is only supportive, as we said. It is invariably fatal. Patients with rabies need heavy sedation, adequate analgesia to relieve terror or pain. This is the aim of management. Acute intervention may be necessary to manage cardiac arrhythmia, respiratory failure, raising tract renal pressure, convulsion. So all the management, the managements that we give to a patient in the intensive care unit, they are all supportive. It's not specific for the disease. Only very occasional survivors has been documented, usually in patients who have received rabies va vaccine before the onset of symptom. Immunization before possible exposure is strongly recommended to travelers who plan to visit regions where rabies is endemic, as it provides protection after unrecognized exposure and may simplify treatment. This is how we manage a case with rabies. After the patient is exposed to a bite, he should receive prophylaxis. If there is a doubt of possibility of rabies, we should give prophylaxis. What is prophylaxis? First, local wound care. Wash thorough with soap and water, debridement as necessary, and plus tetanus prophylaxis. Unfortunately, there was a case who received tetanus prophylaxis and also wound debridement was done for him, but after one month, he developed rabies. Active immunization. Using either human deployed cell vaccine or, or, or alternatively purified chick embryo cell vaccine in five doses given over 28 days. If a bite occurs in a previously immunized patient, two doses are only necessary. So the patient should receive active immunization prior to travel to such areas. Passive immunization is by human rabies immunoglobulin. It should be given immediately before, va uh, before the vaccine. So you give this and then you vaccinate the patient. The wound should be infiltrated with immunoglobulin and then a dose with intravenously, uh, sorry, intramuscularly. Examination of the biting animal. This is the routine. Whenever an animal bites you and you suspect rabies, the animal should be kept for 10 days. If there is clinical suspicion of the rabies, the animal should be killed and the brain should be examined. And also antigen detection in animals using fluorescent antibody techniques or cell culture or mouse inoculation. Thank you very much. We finished CNS infection and we try to, we will only have one other lecture about diseases of the muscle and neuromuscular junction. If it was feasible next week, I will give the last lecture. Thank you very much.